Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. My friends, I want to take a quick moment to give you a special invitation. If you enjoy the Live Inspired podcast, what would you say to joining me live once a month? And not just joining me, but hundreds of other like-minded Live Inspired community members. And what if you could do it from the comfort of your own home? My friends, Live Inspired in Studio with John O'Leary is exactly this, a gathering of our Live Inspired community members once a month for a live inspirational webcast. Let's do life together. Registration for in-studio only happens twice a year. And here's a secret. It's opening soon. Don't miss it. Sign up right now. Be one of the very first to know when Live Inspired in-studio registration opens. You can go right now. Check it out. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. One more time. It's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. Well, hello, my friends. I am John O'Leary, and I'm so happy to have you here joining me in the Live Inspired Movement. We've had the great fortune of interviewing authors and speakers, business owners, overcomers, and a whole litany of amazing individuals. We've had celebrities, movie stars, and announcers. But today we have someone whose very life is so remarkable that Hollywood has turned it into a major motion picture. The returning state champions. You got this. Great choice, Lon. How many teams have earned two championships back to back? Almost none. Caroline, you're the captain. These girls are looking at you to lead this team. I got you. The Miracle Season tells the true story of an Iowa high school's volleyball team that struggles to continue forward after a tragic event. In the movie, which came out April 6th with Helen Hunt, and yes, Helen looks beautiful and my family did enjoy it. She's one of my favorite actresses. She plays an inspiring coach who motivates the team to carry on. In the movie, she was the force in the recovery after a tragedy that moves the entire story, the entire team toward real victory. Well, on today's podcast, I am live in Iowa City, mere miles from that school where the miracle season actually took place, seated at a local brewery across from the real coach herself from the miracle season. Her name is none other than Kathy Bresnahan. She's a teacher. She's a coach. She's an inspiration. And she is our guest here on the Live Inspired podcast today. My friends, as they are brewing beer right behind us, I encourage you right now to uh, open up your can. Open wide your hearts and your journals. Expect something profound from this message today because I know you're going to get it. Kathy, Coach Brez, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you so much, John, for having me today. Oh, gosh, we, we really are thrilled to have you. Kathy and I were talking beforehand, and she said, how did you hear about the movie? And the reality is I heard about the Miracle Season by watching another movie and was so impressed by the previews that I just took my family and we, we, we loved it. We just loved it. And I had no idea who it was really about or where it really took place. I get to speak in Iowa City and then I learned that one of the other speakers is a lady named Coach Kathy Bresnahan. So I'm with the coach herself. We are live. Kathy, for those who don't know you personally, tell us where we are, what you do professionally, and a little bit about your life. Sure. I teach at Iowa City West High School. I'm just finishing my 31st year of teaching there. So that means you're an experienced teacher, which is a nice way of saying (laughs) old. Um, I was a head coach from 87 to 2000 at West High, and then I retired for five years and went back in 2005 till 2013. You uh, have grown in a little bit of notoriety lately Mm -hmm. with not only HBO running a series about your team and your life and some of the events that you endured and overcame, but also just about the way you go about teaching and living and leading forward after tragedy. Let's go back to 2010. Uh, it's a year of great victories for your team and your school, but tell the, tell the listeners right now what, what, what you were teaching, what you were coaching, and what happened during 2010. Well, it was our first state championship. You know, we had been to state before, and we, had, we were among the elite teams in the state, but we would never broke through that glass ceiling. Right. And... Um, 
And volleyball is a highly competitive sport in, in Iowa. I oh, very competitive in Iowa. And we're a large school, 2,000 kids. And uh, we finally reached that pinnacle, and I got to see what all my friends had experienced. And as soon as we won that state championship, I ran up in the bleachers and I hugged <laughs> my mom and dad. And I mean, I just we thought we had the world by the tail, you know. What's the fondest memory from that season? Oh, boy. Um, I think watching the kids celebrate, you know, just the joy of my assistant. My, my assistant coach picked me up and swung me around, and I punched him and said, act like we've been here before. <laughs> right. right? Come on, don't act like this was like the biggest miracle that's ever occurred. Um, but, I mean, I think just the joy. He put so much work in. I mean, yes. Anybody that's accomplished a goal, it doesn't matter what it is, you know how much work went beyond the scenes to get right. to that point. I've read that you had a player on that team, and I, my sisters, two of them, played volleyball. So I know a little bit about it, but I'm not even going to pretend like I'm, I'm overly knowledgeable. Uh, but she was your all-star. She was probably your best player and certainly your leader that she was referred to as the heart and soul. Mm -hmm. Talk about Carolyn Lyon found. Well, Caroline was one of those kids that I depended on as a teacher when I had a, a student struggling. Because she enveloped everybody. She was known for her running hugs. She'd see you down the hallway, even our principal. She'd run down the hall, Dr. Arkenbright, and throw herself in his arms. In fact, one day he came to me and he said, you've got to do something with your setter. <laughs> this is not appropriate for your setter to jump in my arms. But I mean, she was that exuberant, and she was so passionate about life, and just absolutely, you walk, when she walked in the room, she just lit everybody up. You know, she would have talked to you, John, and in two minutes, you're like, yep, I'm her favorite. Yes. I'm her favorite person in the world. She likes me better than every other adult. You know, and that she just had that way of making me feel special. You, you mentioned to me before we started recording that, uh, I said, tell me just a little bit about, about her heart. And you mentioned that you had a little student who felt completely uncomfortable and cast off. Mm -hmm. Talk about him and then talk about what Carolyn did to, to bring him into the loop. Well, he had some kind of mental illness that did not allow, he had panic attacks around crowds. So he was a ninth grader. You come into a cafeteria that's got 1,200 kids sitting there. That's really overwhelming for, under the best of circumstances. Right. So he, I just said, hey, Jordan, this is a safe place. Eat in my room. And he would come down every day. And I thought, all right, now he's a little bit more comfortable with me. So that night at practice, I told Caroline about him. Yes. And next day she showed up and stuck her hand out and said, hi, Jordan, I'm Caroline. I want to be your best friend. You know, and that, I mean, she just sat there with us. And they just bonded immediately. And she ate with them for maybe a week. And then she just said, why don't you come sit with my friends? And so from that point on, I never saw Jordan again other than in class because he was up eating with Caroline. What made her so special, not only around the lunchroom and in the, in the hallways, but specifically on the field? Why was she your heart and soul? Well, your setter is kind of the quarterback on the team. So they have to be an extension of the coach. I could, we train our setters maybe five years to get them ready for varsity competition. So that's a lot of hours one-on-one -on -one with me and that setter because I want them to be – they're Perfect, in. yeah, and, and a great. We have all great setters. They all went on to play Division One volleyball. But Caroline was special in that she knew which kids to push and which kids to say, "Hey, that was my fault. You got the next one." Uh, she was always cut, cutting up the, the toughest practices or the toughest mental kind of things in a game. She would just crack everybody up and get them laughing and ease the tension and yeah. uh, just so. so she jumped the highest, set the biggest <laughs> points. She yelled the loudest. She just was, she loved the sport. She played four sports, but that was her favorite, you know, and she just, you just couldn't help but laugh when you watched her because she was so fun. We frequently take on the shadows of the personality, a little bit of our parents. So I'd like you to talk briefly about her mom and her dad, mm -hmm. starting with her dad, and then we'll talk about mom. You know, I, her dad has this crazy sense of humor, so I know that that's where Caroline got that. But, you know, both her parents were more reserved and so I was like, where did she get this outlandish loudness, you know? But uh, Ernie has a great sense of humor, as did, did her brother and sister. So it's not surprising. And I think her caring and nurturing and her love of people and life came from her mother. Because that's how Ellen was. That she just Talk about Ellen. Uh, she was kind of our team mother. You know, they had the perfect farm that they would have kids out for pool parties. And they had a barn with a dance floor that Ernie renovated. So, you know, for four years, her oldest son's basketball teammates right. were out there for four years. And uh, Catherine, the daughter that was four years older than Caroline, her friends would all go out there. Our kids just lived out there year-round. Ellen gets a diagnosis. I believe it's pancreatic mm -hmm. cancer. Stage four. Stage four pancreatic cancer. 
when you hear this, how do you respond? Well, Caroline came to me. Caroline told you. The next morning, and, and usually she'd come flying to my room and slam the door open, even though I'd admonish her and say, please just open it quietly. <laughs> and I could tell by her face something was wrong, and she, we talked, and she told me, and then she just grabbed me and said, tell me the truth. What, what are my mom's chances? You know, and, and, that, and that's a tough one. I mean, you want to lie, make everything feel good, and um, I couldn't lie to her. You know, we were too close, and I just said, um, you know, what any, I hope any adult would say it, that there's always hope. Yes. There's always hope, but, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, this was Easter, going into end of Caroline's junior year, and like, how are we going to get through this upcoming season? You know, as a coach, you're thinking about that, and what am I going to do to support my setter? And uh, and the rest of my girls are going to be grief-stricken. This diagnosis spawns her to make a commitment for the following year. Do you remember what she said, what the commitment was? Win for Mama. She, uh, I learned later on that she dedicated the entire season yep. upcoming to her mother, and the, the promise was made, we will repeat. Yep. We're going to do this thing again, and we're going to do it for our mother. She painted it on her shoes. She painted it on her yeah. shoes. Uh, well, that's going to come back because those yeah. shoes are going to be re remain part of the 2011 season. Yeah. The mother, Ellen, gets sicker and sicker and sicker near the very end of her life. You're dreading the phone call because you know it's coming. You know Ellen doesn't have much longer on earth, and you know it's going to ring, and then you get that phone call that you've been dreading. But it's even worse than you expect. Well, it's just four days into the season, and I saw it was from one of my other captains, Charlie Stump. And she was just as outlandish as Caroline. And all summer they would call and wake me up and they thought that was really funny. And, <laughs> you know, give me a hard time about something I had done in practice or open gym. And so I picked it up and I said, Caroline, Shelly, this isn't funny. I'm going to sleep. We have practice in the morning. And they, Shelly just started screaming and said, no, don't hang up. Don't hang up. There's been an accident. Caroline got killed at 12.30 in the morning. And I mean, of course, I, I thought they meant her mother. You know, there was no way I didn't. I, I couldn't, my brain wouldn't even wrap itself around the fact that this essence of life had been crushed and snuffed out. So I have lost several dear friends at young phases in life, and I think it's, it's even more unimaginable when it happens to someone who's vibrantly alive. Mm -hmm. I would imagine for you expecting the call eventually either to be a prank or the bad news of, mm -hmm. of this teen mother. It was almost unbearable to think that someone who is as full of life as Lyme, your friend Carolyn, could uh, have her life snuffed out like this. Well, it was unfathomable. I mean, how do you... First off, I heard she was in a moped accident. I knew she didn't have a moped. Right. So then it was like, it just can't, this just can't be right. There's no way she would have rode that moped during the season had I known it. You know, your setter is just too valuable to get an injury and, and things like that. And... Um, then your mind is just turning and thinking, how do we go through? How do I even, I can't even handle my own, own grief. How am I going to meet with 15 kids tomorrow morning? Yeah. And what, where do we go from here? So how, how, what, what do you do? You know you're meeting with the kids in the morning. How do you begin that meeting? Well, we just said we'll meet at our standard practice time, which was 8 a.m. So my assistants and I showed up at 6, and the kids didn't follow along. I mean, they didn't go to sleep all night. And um, we left the lights off in the gym, and I just... All night I kept thinking, we're just going to go sit where Caroline was last, in the setter spot on our main court. And we're just all going to squeeze into that one spot that's a setter target area. And um, we started to do that, and then I started realizing there's hundreds of other kids off in the shadows of the gym. And I think they just felt closest to Caroline by being around the volleyball team. Mm -hmm. And that continued to grow then throughout the season. It's all so emotional. You know, I... Uh... A good dog food commercial will get me to cry, so I, I expect plenty You're of tears. I'm already that happens, uh, yeah. it happens. Plus, we're at a brewery, so yeah. I, I'm going to blame it on the yeah. beer. Uh, there's a visitation, and uh, I think we all hope to live the kind of life where a few people come, and some of them even have last names not called O'Leary or right. Bresnahan yeah. or whatever it may be. Uh, I learned not not only does the majority of the school and the community come, but kids from all over Iowa. Mm -hmm. You have teams of volleyball players showing up. And they came in their jerseys. Why? Because, it, you know, when Caroline would go into gym through club season and stuff, she went around and met as many people as she could. Her goal, I think, was to have 10,000 Facebook friends of people that she legitimately knew, you know. And she went around and just met people everywhere she went. So she, you know, it would be schools or on the other side of Iowa. I mean, she knew people, you know. So part of it was out of respect for the family. There's so many people, thousands. People waited two, three, four hours to get in the gym. 
and um, you know they they would come through in their volleyball uniforms, and um, it was solidarity within the right. volleyball community. But it was just because Carolina had that kind of effect on people. Ernie, who is this seemingly just remarkable, mm -hmm. humble, funny, great natured guy, has the unbearable task of telling his dying wife that their daughter has has passed, has already died. She, you know, is trying to make sense of this. She's in the end stage of her own life. She is absolutely dying, but she's able to make it to the funeral. Do you, do you remember her being there? Oh, I mean, we didn't think she was going to make it. Of course. You know, the, you know that was the, the scuttlebutt going around that she was just too sick. And um, the volleyball team, they put us in our own room prior to the services, which was nice, like they do with the family. And we just saw him talk in there. We, we didn't expect Ellen to make it, and she did, and with, in, by ambulance, and came in with in a wheelchair. And um, in the funeral, you know, what struck me that night, John, or that day, John, was the, how the look that kept passing between Ernie and, and Ellen. And it was absolutely, oh, just the love and that was passing between them. I thought, I can't imagine having that kind of strength of relationship. It was just amazing, you know. And when the funeral service was over, Ernie brought the wheelchair up, and she said no. And she took the last steps of her life, leaving her daughter's funeral. Mm. From their journey, they journey out of the church, and you journey back somehow into the life that is yours now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the world hasn't stopped spinning. No. And school continues, and the season continues, and you can't quit on this. How do you begin guiding and coaching and leading a team when their leader is gone? What do you, as a coach, what do you do? Well, we had no setter. You yeah. know, we, we plan years in advance where our next setter is going to be. And our next setter for varsity was a freshman. So that wasn't an issue. That wasn't a possibility. Um, and at that point, I couldn't even conceive. It was inconceivable to even be on the court. To me, it was, how do I even get my kids through each day? Right. You know, this was where they loved to be. This was their favorite spot every day to come um, after school. And we loved each other. We loved being together. And now it was just an open scab to be on that court. You know, that 90 by 30 foot court was just um, painful. W weren't you looking to your left, waiting for her to walk in? Well, you were so you know quiet. I mean? Every day she'd walk in and throw the stereo on so loud. And every day the kids would wait for like five seconds. And then they'd be, line, turn the stereo down. <laughs> every single, every day we went through this. So it was so quiet. You know, not only did we not ever laughter, we didn't have music. We didn't have... Um, somebody pushing everybody on and you mentioned the name right there and I I haven't heard a reason why yet why, why the name line that's her nickname why don't you go by the name line she's the only person got to pick her own nickname I yeah. called her lost and found for a few <laughs> years and she didn't like that like she just wanted, didn't like Caroline you know like line your uh, your season continues the practices continue you find a center mm -hmm. someone who doesn't feel up for the role talk about that person well, after our first match, and, and we were trying different people in the role, and I just decided we couldn't continue to do that. I needed to make that decision, knowing that whoever I picked was going to put the worst burden on them that any adult could ask a child. And I picked Kelly Fleeler because she was athletic. She was a 4.0 student. Being a setter is very right. complex um, skill. And I knew she'd be a quick learner, and, and but I, she was also one of Caroline's best friends. So... To her mind, she was replacing her best friend on the court, you know, and she told me no. You know, and I remember just pulling her off the side and said, Kelly, you got to trust me like you've trusted no one ever your entire life. Trust me, I can train you. Trust me, I can get you through this. Trust me, we can do this together. And even that, I don't think, until one of the kids said, Caroline would want you to do this. That, that was the turning point for her, but boy, she struggled the whole season emotionally. I mean, that, what a terrible thing to put on her. Because I think she felt immediately that the, the team's success was based on her, and she wasn't trained as a setter. There was a motto that begins to pull this team, this school, and the community mm -hmm. together. Live like mine. Yeah. What does live like mine mean? I had someone, a little kid just write me and ask me that. And I said, what do you think it means? You Are saw you saying I ask questions similar to that? Well, a 10-year-old girl, yeah. Similar <laughs> right. to a 10-year-old pre 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 little girl, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, I always tell people it, it's all what we want to internalize. To me, um, it means treating people with kindness, living life to its fullest, smile when you don't feel like smiling, 
um, reach out, mm-hmm. you know. And I, so I think all of us have, I think for the team, that's what it means. And for us, was that you're going to step on their court and play with passion like her, and honor Caroline that way. But, I mean, they sold, I think, 3,000 T-shirts that first week. You know, and then reprinted thousands and thousands across the state. And um, I th- for us, it was the whole school, for a large school, John, what was amazing was that when people were kind that whole school year, which you don't see in a big school. There's a lot of drama, every size school. And people were kind. It was the most amazing teaching experience I've had to see people go out of the way. And they started a blog mm. of, of just random nice things to people. And uh, it was... a uh, a unifying slogan for all of us. Do, do you remember your first victory after her death? Yeah, it was our first match we won. You won your first match? Yeah. Yeah, and you would have thought we'd won a state championship. And then walking in before that match was Ernie and his family. We, we never mentioned that her mom died 12 days after her. And he was, he was burying his wife the next day, and he showed up at our first match. So in the movie, all be miracle season watchers. He, they have him not going to the movie or to the matches, and uh, he never missed one. So the kids ran over, and I think that was enough to buoy them up for a moment. We lost the next two that night, but we then, had some wins. You had some wins. You start finding pennies from heaven. What does that mean to you? I, you know, I had a total <clears throat> breakdown right one night. I mean, as adults, we try to shoulder everything. Right. You know, beer can only do so much in life, right? <laughs> And um, I'm not someone that leans on friends or family. I kind of internalize everything. And I just had a breakdown. I mean, I absolutely could not be in that gym one more minute. And I sent him home early. It was a Friday. And I went into my office, 10 steps away, just shut the lights off and started sobbing, crying, crying. You know, those ugly ugly cry. It was an ugly cry. And I just said, Caroline, I need some sign that you're okay. And anything, you know, it doesn't have to be big. Just tell me, show me, tell me that you're okay. And, um, and, I, and I looked down, and there's two pennies heads up right where I'd just been looking. And I thought, okay, you're a little nuts, but there must be one more penny somewhere then, if this is really a sign from her. And I'm looking everywhere, and there's nowhere. And I just scream up at the sky, like, Caroline, quit messing with me. You always mess with me. Where's that other dang penny? <laughs> and I start to leave, and there's the third penny right, right outside my door. You know, and, and then... You know, I kept thinking people were setting it up that we'd find these pennies. Right. But, I mean, like the bus pulled up to one spot to pick us up for the state championship game, and it was raining, so we signaled them to another spot, getting in three pennies right there at the base of the door. And, just you know, size. just, yeah, it was just, uh, I, don't, I don't think it was a coincidence. It starts to turn the season. I mean, there's a lot of things that turn the season. When you win games, I understand that there's a song you sing. Sweet Caroline. So my wife and I, you know, uh, our first dance back in college was to a song by Neil Diamond. You want to take a wild guess what it might have been? Cracklin' Rolls? Yeah, I wish. Yeah, okay. Times never seem so good. Someday, someday, someday. Sweet Caroline, and it's been our song ever since. And so I, when I learned that this was also your song and for that season and for all the teams and brought the community together, it was another, another sign that we needed to do this podcast. What, what did singing that song as a gym do for that gym. Well, you know what's ironic is Caroline didn't like that song. Most Carolines yeah, don't for yeah. whatever reason. And I was trying to think before our first home match what things I could do to um, bring some levity and some... Not, so it wasn't just a moment of silence. I asked people to greet each other and meet strangers, and that was really amazing. And then the kids didn't know this was going to happen, and then I had it all queued up and ready, and our uh, M- MC put it on, and the Kids came running out of the stands and joined the players and jumping up and down and singing. And then we started doing that every home match. Take me through the, the race toward the state championship. It's one that you aren't expected to win, of course. Right. Uh, walk me through a couple of the peaks and a couple of the valleys. You know, we, we kept winning. You know, we finished the season 39-6, and six, which is a great season. But at any point, I mean, we just would barely, we never practiced. You know, the kids were either screwing around, because that was, and I knew that was how they were dealing with grief, or they were outside crying. And the one thing they said they would never do is cry on the court. So when one would become overwhelmed, they'd run outside, and then two more, you know, girls, and two more would go outside, <laughs> and pretty soon the whole team was outside crying. Um, I didn't think we had the mental fortitude to win state. Right. And so I, I thought each week, and I was feeling like, this is, this is on me. I don't have them ready. I know they expected to win state, but I didn't think we could. Um... 
we never had, I kept thinking the wheels were going to fall off. You know, I kept thinking we're going to have one bad loss and the season's so, done. Right. Yeah, and it, but it never did. It's like we were just kind of treading water, actually like slush. It was like almost like a mud. Right. And uh, we're just kind of wallowing our way through. And so we qualified for the state tournament. I don't, honestly, I don't know how we got to that point. I think it was just the resiliency of youth and that mindset. When you have 15 people committed, well, 18 with the coaches, committed to one goal, that we weren't going to be denied. How, how were you helping those girls deal with their grief? I mean, the, 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 this is their leader, their heart and soul, and their captain who is no longer with them. How do you guide them through not losing a player, but losing a dear friend? I think the best thing I did was leave down my boundaries and let them know how much I love them. Now we always say, love you, when we hang up and stuff. I would never have done that. And I think I gave them the latitude to grieve how they wanted. Like, mm -hmm. we'd have a player that was angry and would lash out and just get in my face or her teammates. You know, and I understood what was going on. And I think because I didn't make anybody conform, and they helped me as much. I mean, I wasn't. this wasn't me. This was about the kids and what they were able to do. Um, I think I just was able to guide them enough. You, you guided them enough that they not only began moving through their grief, but they make it to the state championship game. Mm -hmm. A shocking, right? a shocking event. And we're it, playing our crosstown rivals. And that's going on yeah. too. Do you remember what you said in the locker room before you, you took the floor? Yeah, you know, I, I, we had made, I cut out butterflies and said when they're nervous, we would had this talk about when they're nervous, everybody has butterflies. Um, let's put them in formation, make them work for you. <laughs> And I bought this huge beaded butterfly, and I knew I was going to use it at the state tournament if we made it. Right. And each kid had their own butterfly, and they wrote their fears on it. And then I had a big post board, and I said, all right, put them in whatever formation you want. Glue them on there. And they made it a big L. And then I asked Kelly to put the beaded one on that represented Caroline. She put right it in the leader spot. And that's each, we did all three games. We They uh, wrote their fears and what they were most afraid of, and then they put them on the put them on the butterfly and let Caroline take care of them, fly them away. Well, she did a lousy job in the first game. <laughs> in the championship, both first games. You know, you play best of five to 25, and you have to win by two. Yes. Uh, we lost the first game 27 to 29. We lost the second set 25 to 27. Which means you're one game away from losing. We're one best of five, yeah. And you need to win three consecutive to have it. Right. In City, I was ranked number two in the state, and... and uh, I just thought, oh, God, I did pray. At that point, I've never prayed for a game in my life. I just said, <laughs> Lord, please let us win one game. You know, at this point, I'm like, we can't get swept. Yeah, I didn't care. Once again, I didn't care about the winning at any point in the season other than it was important to the girls. And uh, not only did we come back, we, we tied it up 2-2. Two -two. Mm. You know, but that game just went back and forth and back and forth. And um, City High served for the championship point four times and missed all four serves. Only serves they missed the whole state tournament. I mean, not even close. They were saw some of the highlights. Graders. They went right into yeah. the middle of the net. Yeah, it was, you know, and Ernie said it was divine intervention. We were like, oh, no. Caroline was too nice. Now, Ellen, her mom, might have been behind it. But Caroline, <laughs> Caroline likes City Heights. So we'll give credit would, to Ellen yeah. on this one. I, I gave Ellen all the credit. You, uh, to give away the ending, I think you end up winning the fifth game. Yep. Walk me through the emotion of having that final. By the way, the ball hits the line. A terrible shot to try to do. It was an awesome shot. It, it hits right on the line, and I thought, isn't that ironic? Here is line, no longer with your team, but still guiding that ball forward yeah. to hit, boom, exactly Just where it needed to. Just barely hit the line. Yeah, Shelly Stump came in with the side. Like, you use in pool. You know, right. You could spin on the ball. Right. And from the angle she was hitting, that was the worst thing she could have done, but hit that line. I can remember dropping to the floor, and I felt like the weight of the world was off my shoulders. And then I just felt lost because I thought, now what are we going to do? Because we had each other every day, you know what I mean? Yes. We, we relied on each other every single day at 3.30, and it was like, what are we going to do without each other now? You know, that was my first thing before I even got up to celebrate that we won. We're like, what, what, nice. heck, what now? How do we do this now? You know? What was it like holding up that trophy, singing Sweet Carolina, Sweet Carolina, and looking into the stands and seeing this place going crazy? Surreal. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, how do you, no one, no one could have drafted that story. It wasn't believable by anybody. You know, if no. Hollywood would have wrote that script, you would have said. Well, to be very sad. honest with you, when I first saw the previews of that movie, not knowing the story behind it, I thought this is kind of lame, because I thought it was, 
Right. It, you see a lot in Hollywood based on a true story. Right. And then you learn later on, well, she didn't actually die. She tore, she hurt her Achilles and she yeah. was on the bed. Like, so it's not based on a true right. story. Yeah. Then you learn about this one. And it's not only based on a true, it is a true story. Right. It is the real deal. Yeah. So what, what is that like having this Hollywood ending in your life? Oh, it, it's really rewarding that so many people have been inspired by this. And, I, and then Caroline's legacy is going on. Our Live Like Line Foundation is just flourishing. And we help kids in the, in the community participate in activities. Um, I feel like we, I feel good that I've had a small part of keeping this going. So people are going to know Caroline Fallon and mostly my 15 girls that were so important to me. Right. That are like my daughters. You know, they did an amazing thing, you know. It's like, wow, young athletes, you can watch these kids and you too can be great. Do you think their lives are better because of that season? Do you think they're better women today because of what they went through in I think we're all better people because of what we went through that season. I mean, I, there's been many times I've been ready to make a decision like, what would Lyon do? If I'm going to live like Lyon, this is not the decision I should be making. So it's changed me. I mean, the, the girls are, it still is hard for the girls. You know, that she was just, Caroline was just bigger than life. And, yes. um, the first time they saw the movie, we got to preview it privately, and they, that was hard for them. And then the second time they saw it, they were laughing at Helen Hunt's character. <laughs> and I said, I was not that big of a dork. And they're like, yeah, you are. So I, I think they got to see some enjoy it and laugh a little bit more the second time the right. we premiere here. So J-Lo was unavailable to play you? Is what yeah, I, I guess she just went and do that New York blues or whatever stupid Is that what it was? Daily New York made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wrote a letter to, I believe, HBO. Is that correct? No, I didn't even know there was an HBO. I wrote just to Frank DeFord and sent it to Time Warner, who owned Sports Illustrated. Did, did you have any any idea at all that not only would you at one point raise this trophy and, and help heal these girls for a lifetime, it's a big deal, help bring healing to a dad who's mourning his wife and his daughter, bring peace to an entire community here in Iowa City, did you ever see this thing going beyond Iowa City, beyond no, Iowa, and no. around the country, now around the world? No. All because of that letter to Frank DeFord. Do you believe in uh, yeah. fate? I mean, do you believe that this is just meant uh, to be? I, I, maybe. Maybe. So many things lined up that make me think that sometimes. I mean, what are the odds of me just simply sending a letter to New York City, Time Warner, and Frank DeFord? I mean, to me, I was just throwing it away. I, I just unloaded my emotions on this man, not thinking he'd ever read it. It was a right. safe release for me. You know, I didn't feel like I could, I could unload my emotions from that season on anybody else. And um, he got the darn thing and called me, you know. That doesn't happen in real life. It doesn't happen in no. real life. No. Well, I'm glad it happened in this real life. Me too. Looking back on that season and, uh, and now back on your coaching career, what have you learned? You know what, I, I think the biggest thing as a young coach, because when you come out as an athlete, you're so competitive. You know, you like played softball, is that right? Oh, I, I was volleyball, basketball in college. Okay. Back when you could be short. <laughs> right. Things and have uh, you could get by with just heart. I, I learned, I, I, knew, I knew a lot about volleyball, but I realized kids don't care, or your team doesn't care, or I don't care if it's work or whatever, how much you know about your business or your sport until they know you care about them as a person. And that, 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 philosophy that season changed everything. I had to show my players how much I cared about them and how much I loved them and that their, their needs were first and foremost in my right. life. And that changed, that changed everything. What, what would you say to those of us coaching up our kids? I have four. Don't. Or, <laughs> stop, stop. Stop while you're ahead. Stop the madness. You do teach health ed. We're not going to talk about that on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. What would you say to coaches who are pursuing victories, Ws? Don't. So what, instead, what should we pursue as a coach? That's easy to say when you have a bazillion of wins. You know, I got a great career coaching record. I don't remember. I remember my relationships with my kids. So I would just say keep developing those relationships, you know. Um, and once again, it doesn't have to just be sports. It can be right. your workplace, wherever, in your families. Um, that's what I treasure is hearing from my players again and, and how much volleyball changed their life. And they don't remember which that they didn't win the state championship. Those aren't the the state championship winners. When you 
pray over it, think about it, reflect on it, and you hear the voice of one of your players lying, speaking to you today, what, what do you think she's saying to you now? Heck yeah. A movie about me, you bet. She we got to talk about the movie too. Yeah. Before we run out of time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We're, we're bumping up against the hour. The uh, Helen Hunt character. She played you. You met her. Uh, what's that interaction like? Oh, you know, she said, well, why don't you fly out to my house for a couple of days? Right. Like, <laughs> like, Seriously? Am I getting punked by Jimmy Kimmel? What is going on here? Uh, it was crazy. She really threw herself in the role. I mean, from the walk to talking to what we call her addiction coach. And um, she would call when they're on set and say, in this situation, if this had really happened in your season, how would you have reacted? Yes. So she really tried to put herself in the mind of a coach. Uh, she did a phenomenal job, and she played a she remarkable like character. She acted like a total She was awesome. Oh, my heavens. She was mean. She reminds me of someone I'm speaking to right now, actually. She was mean. She wasn't funny. I know. I'm funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in every Live Inspired podcast, we have the opportunity of not only meeting fascinating individuals, I'm across from one right now, but of asking all of them the seven questions. We call them the Live Inspired all right. Seven. Whew. So all you've right. got to somehow wrap up not only an incredible career, but now an incredible podcast by running the gauntlet, at being right. asked seven questions, all stretch right. out, Hold coach. On. All right, all right, okay, I'm good. I'm all good. right, here we go. What is the best book that you have ever read? The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. It's my favorite right now. Talk about it. Oh, it's just, I love her writing style, and it follows two sisters during the World War II and what they each did during the war, and I just loved how she wrote the book. What's one positive characteristic, one trait, that you possessed when you were a child that you wish you exhibited more so today? Oh, more spontaneity? No, that's not true. Um, carriage. I'll go spontaneity. Spontaneity? My life's pretty off the wall. I okay. think that now they call it ADHD. <laughs> I'm glad we weren't treated because yeah. I would have been treated myself yeah. and been in a very different yeah. place today. Yeah. If your home caught fire and all living people, all living things are out and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, what would you go in and grab? Um, my picture of my dad. Talk about your dad then. Uh, he died three years ago. He was, he was just my biggest fan. And you're saying my dog Charlie's out, right? Da Charlie's, Charlie's safe. Right, Charlie's, Charlie's wagging her tail. All right. If you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, okay, who would you want to have that nice long visit with? Hmm. I think I'd like to talk to Mother Teresa. She just seemed like such a wise person and kind person. I would just like to say, wow, how'd you do that? What do you think she would respond? Drugs. No, I... <laughs> Yeah, no, she had such an unbelievable faith, and, and she was such a, gave her whole life to the poor. Yes. You know, I think she would have one of those quiet, reflective, I'm loud, I think she would be quiet, reflective, and, yeah. I think she would keep remind praying. you in, in I short. I think she'd tell me to keep praying. I need stay faithful, help. live like lying, <laughs> yeah. and do it anyway. Yeah, okay. What's the best advice that you've ever received? Um, probably when that season was over, or started, and Caroline died, one of my best friends, Tom Keating, called me from New York Wallet, and he said, grieve for three days. And, so then, and he said, you can't write off the season. You can't go through the emotions. Go do what you guys do best. Play volleyball. You follow that advice? Yep. But do you pass that advice on to the girls? We did. Yeah. We did talk about it. We have to move on. We have to honor her. Not, not, not win for line. Play like line. Amen. Yeah. You, you mentioned play like line and honor her, and I forgot to bring up, but I think it's so relevant, the shoes. She wrote on her shoes her mother's name, and it was a season intended to not only win, but to win for her mother. You kept those shoes. Kept those shoes, and that was another of those things, because I kept trying to think what, what things we needed to have established for the whole season, right, before our first game. And I just decided when I pulled Caroline off, she'd always sit on the first bench, first seat on the bench, and I would just talk to her one-on-one. -on -one. There was a team would be down here. And so I said, we're going to put those shoes on her the first share of the whole season. And they sat there the they whole season. They started from the first match on. The, the, but then when we switch games, switch mat, uh, the seats during between games, because you switch benches, we're like, now what do we do with the shoes? We never thought that through, but so we just parted. The, the shoes, shoes moved. The shoes moved. And I'm asking you more than the Live Inspired 7, because I'm curious in hearing that. In seeing those shoes move, and in knowing the woman who used to wear them, how do you think this affected the other girls playing against you? We kept them under the chair. I mean, we really, truly, 
we didn't want our group to be a public spectacle. But they all knew. So I'm curious, no, knowing what had happened to your team, how do you think the other teams looked across the With net sympathy at you? For a long time, people didn't know how to quite react right. to us. And then, then we we're just, I think other teams just looked at us as West High. That's that they're defending state champs. We want to beat them. We didn't have time for pity party. They had to get after it. Yeah. So did you. Yeah. Two more questions. You've almost run the gauntlet. Number six, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? Oh, my God, be healthier. (laughs) (laughs) Don't be so stupid. Coach Kathy Bresnahan, it's been said that all great people and coaches and inspirations can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? Ooh. Um, I would hope they would say she lived her life to the fullest. She cared about people and helped them laugh. Well, Coach, Coach Perez, you have indeed lived your life to the fullest. You have lived like mine, and we are so honored that you spent a little bit of your day with us. Loved it. I had a blast. My friends. The gauntlet seven was tough. Oh, it's man. tough. It's not easy. It's the hardest season you've ever had, I'm sure. Yeah. This is Coach Bresnahan, the movie. Tell us again. The Miracle Season. The, the, book. Mi- the Miracle Season and the book. Both are incredibly worthy. Check it out. Check out her. Live like line and live inspired. Thank you so much, John. It's an honor. All right. Thank you. Thank you. My friends, I want to take a quick moment to give you a special invitation. If you enjoy the Live Inspired podcast, what would you say to joining me live once a month? And not just joining me, but hundreds of other like-minded Live Inspired community members. And what if you could do it from the comfort of your own home? My friends, Live Inspired in Studio with John O'Leary is exactly this, a gathering of our Live Inspired community members once a month for a live inspirational webcast. Let's do life together. Registration for in-studio only happens twice a year. And here's a secret, it's opening soon. Don't miss it. Sign up right now. Be one of the very first to know when Live Inspired in-studio registration opens. You can go right now. Check it out. It's at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio. One more time. It's johnolearyinspires.com forward slash studio.